Father, in this book that we've been studying through, this book of Revelation, four times your son says, I'm coming soon, even as we've just sung. So, Father, you've created us to be a people of expectation, a people whose lives are lived in such a way that we're expectant of the fact that Jesus is coming again. So, Father, I pray that that would change the way that we worship this morning, that it would change the way that we listen, that as we go out from this place and into the places that you've called us to, that it would change the way that we live our lives because we know that you're coming again. And so, Lord, we know how the story ends and we know why you're coming again and we know that you came the first time to save. So, Father, I pray that you'd make us a people, make us a church of expectation. So, Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you be seated, please? I forgot to say, you're not only the people with four-wheel drive, you're also the people who remembered to set your clocks back. Or, or you just use your phone like me, and, uh, you know, and the telephone company does it for you. Uh, so, anyway, let me invite the kids up through grade five. Uh, if, if they would like to slip out, there's a time for them. Let me invite you if you would open a Bible, your Bible or one of the black ones around you, there should be plenty of them this morning. Uh, you could open five Bibles. That'd be great. You could look on every side of you and have a Bible in front of you. To Revelation, if you're new to the Bible, just turn to the back and you'll pass the index. You'll find the book of Revelation. We're in Revelation chapter 3. Uh, we're going to be looking at verses 7 through 13 this morning. Revelation 3, 7 through 13. The old story, perhaps you've heard it before, but the old story goes that there was a national uh, sales gathering for one of the national dog food companies. And the CEO stood up before the eager salesmen from all over the nation and he said to them, who uses the best ingredients in all of the industry? And they all cried out in one voice, we do. And who uses the best packaging in all of the industry? And they all said, we do. And he says, and who has the best advertising in all of the industry? And of course, they all cried out, we do. And then he said, then why out of eight national dog food companies are we number seven? And the room was silent until one first year salesman calls out, because the dogs don't like it. <laughs> and here we are this morning. Here we are. We sit as a church. See, I paused for you to laugh because that's usually what I have to do with my jokes is pause for laughter so that you know that you're supposed to laugh at that time. Here we are sitting in the capital district of New York. We're sitting in a place, and I've, I've said this statistic to you before, or numerous times before, that we sit in a city where 80% plus of our neighbors not only don't attend a gospel church, they don't attend any kind of church, Jewish, Muslim, nothing. They don't attend any kind of church. And people have said for a while, they've said, well, the next generation seems to be more religious. And that's false too. That's been disproven. While people may be more religious or at least equally religious as they have been in the past, they're not more inclined the younger you get to find them in a Bible-believing church. So now that I'm here to encourage you this morning, why is it that it seems that people don't much like what the church is selling? Well, the world would say to you that what we need to do is to adapt to the culture or die. We've got to change our message. We've got to make it more palatable. We've got to make it more 21st century America. And if we could just do that, just rescue it out of uh, the patriarchal age that it was written in and update it for today, then people would be more engaged. But the problem is, if you've been with us, you've seen so far in these seven letters to these churches, we've covered five, this is number six, you've seen Jesus say to more than one of them, to more than one of them, if you adapt to the culture around you, you will die. You as a church will die. I will take away your lampstand. If you adapt to the culture around you and you continue going down that path and teaching people a false kind of gospel, then you may in fact die physically because God so values the integrity of his church that he might just take your life. 
to keep you from leading God's people astray. He says, if you adapt, I'll kill you. I'll take you away. I'll take out your gospel light. So if I can channel uh, the great philosopher Yoda, uh, it, it seems stuck between a rock and hard place we are. Not able to adapt and yet required to adapt. What do we do? And so you, while you long for your loved ones to come to know Christ, sons, daughters, son-in-laws, daughter-in-laws, or your friends, or your neighbors, or your co-workers, you long for them to come to Christ. And so you pray, and you pray, and you pray. You want to make a difference. You want to make a difference in their life for eternity, but it feels like what we have, it feels like it's old product. It's been sitting on the shelf too long. The door of opportunity, it seems, has closed. If I had a dollar for every time I had a well-meaning Christian say to me, if only we could go back to the time of Billy Graham. What we really need is Billy Graham. What we really need are the ones that came before him. As though God is sitting up in heaven, wringing his hands, going, if only I had another Billy Graham. If only I had that person. You see, we say to ourselves, it must be, it must be that the reason that my friends, my loved ones, my community is not coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, it must be because I'm too weak. It must be because I'm too untalented, because I'm too insignificant, because I don't have the right words, because I don't have the right clothes, because I don't have the right platform from which to speak. If only I had those things. If God just had someone else, if God just had someone else other than me to speak into that person's life, to speak into that workplace's life, to speak into that school, to speak into whatever. If God just had someone else, then God could do something great. If you've ever thought that before, I say to you with all the love in my heart, I've thought it, so I'm saying it to myself too, get over yourself. Get over yourself. You see, we're going to see three things this morning in this passage. We're going to see a door. We're going to see a key, and we're going to see a pillar. And I want to set those three things in front of you, just as sort of like hooks for you to hang uh, what, we're, uh, what we're talking about. Now, I know some of you are habituated to look up at the screens. My PowerPoint did not have four-wheel drive this morning, all right? It didn't make it here, all right? So it's okay. I want you to look at God's Word, and I want you to listen to me this morning as we talk through these things. So look at your Bible. Look at chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 8. I'm going to read verses, uh, I'm sorry, verse 7. We're gonna, I'm going to read verses 7 and 8, and I want you to follow along because I want you to see it in God's Word this morning. It says in verse 7, it says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, right, not the one in PA, the one in Asia, the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Now, I want us just to consider this morning, I want us to consider, we're talking about community, and, and I want to take you back to one of the very first sermons that, that we talked about when we entered into this study. I want to remind you of what unites us together and calls us to call others into the very same thing that unites us together. I want you to look, I want you to focus just for a minute on what Paul calls this treasure that we have in clay vessels. This treasure that we have in jars of clay. It is, as we see here in our text this morning in verse 7, it is the words of the Holy One, the True One. The words of the Holy One, the True One. And I want you to get this first. Things are a little out of order, but you're smart people. You can follow along. I want you to see this this morning. I want you to see when we talk about mission, we're talking this morning about mission and opportunity. 
I want you to see this morning that our mission is the gospel, always, simply, always the gospel, period. If you've ever wondered what church is for, it's for the gospel. It's a vehicle for the gospel to be preached into my life, into your life, and for you to go out and preach it into the lives of others. The mission is always the gospel. And what he is saying here is, he says, and the gospel is true. God is holy. God doesn't change. His word is perfect. His word is true. Whatever my experience is in my workplace or in my school or with my loved one and praying for them and wanting them to come to know Christ, whatever my experience is, however I feel about it, what we have in the gospel, these are perfect, faultless, completely true words from the perfect, faultless, completely holy God. And so as we speak, as we speak about what this book says about God, it's true. When we speak about what this book says about us, it's true. When we speak about what the, this book says about the world, it's true. We can know that with certainty. That's why Jesus introduces himself to this church this way. I'm the holy one. I'm the true one. And what he says is not subject to a popularity contest. It's not subject to an opinion poll for the world to be able to speak into it and say, well, let's take this part out or let's put another part in or let's change this or soften that or make it accommodate to the things of the world that we really, really like. But that the word as it stands calls us out from. It's holy and it's true. I love John chapter 6. You probably know these verses as well. Verses 67 and 68, where Jesus looks around and he's saying something hard and a lot of people left that were there listening before. A lot of them left. And Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, are you going to go away too? And Simon Peter says, Lord, where else can we go? You alone have the words of life. Only you have the words of life. It's true. It's life-giving. The message is not faulty. It's not in need of modification. And I say all of that so that you know that as a believer, as you take God's word and you go out and you speak into your workplace or into your community or into your school or with your loved one or your friend or whatever else, when you go out, the message is not broken. The message is holy, it is perfect, and it is true. And God's word says that it will not return without accomplishing what God intended for it to accomplish. It's also, we're going to see, it's not dependent on our talents. It's not dependent on our skills. It's not dependent on our strength. It's not dependent on our goodness with the words, right? It's not dependent on our relative good looks. Thank the Lord for that, right? It's not dependent on any of those things. What does he say about this church in verse 8? Look at it. What's the defining characteristic of this church? He says, you have but a little power. You're very weak. You're very small. There's not many of you. You have but a little power. But I want you to notice that Philadelphia is one of only two of the seven churches that Jesus has nothing bad to say about. Nothing bad. Their little power is not a problem for Jesus at all. This is not something that Jesus had to overcome. This is not something that he had to somehow, you know, it, it ruined uh, their, their, their uh, opportunity. It was, wasn't their reason for failure. I want you to see that this is the basis for the opportunity that they have in front of them. What does Paul say about himself? He says, he says, I asked the Lord three times to take away this thorn in the flesh. And God said, no. Because he says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. The weakness of this church, the little power of this church, look around. Okay, I want to really, I want you to look around just for a second, all right? I want you to see we're a church like the church in Philadelphia. I pray in more than just numbers, okay? Your little power is the reason for the open door that's in front of you. That's what he's saying to this church. 
Your little strength is the reason for the opportunity that exists for you. Look at verse 8, because here's why. Because you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Now, I'm not saying that every small church is a, is a good church, right? I'm not saying that at all. Us, us being few in numbers doesn't make us a great church, but here's the defining characteristic. They were people that were identified by their faithfulness to God's word. That's what makes them a great church. Now, in their situation, it's probably also what made them a small church. That's not true in every place. That's not true in every time. I'm not saying that big churches are bad churches. I'm not saying that at all. The defining characteristic of this church is their faithfulness to God's word. Their faithfulness to God's word. The power is in the word and the great God who breathed it out, not the weak vessels that carry it. So when you look in the mirror in, this, in the morning, when you go into your workplace and you say, I'm not able, I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I can't speak right. That may be true of you. It is not true of the Word of God. The National Archives, if you've been there before, I know many of you have. If you've ever been to the National Archives in Washington, D.C., you will walk into that room and you will find someplace there in the center of the room, you'll find the Constitution of the United States. You will not be able to touch it. It will be under glass, just in case you've never seen national treasure. I don't know, that's where most of you get your knowledge of these things from these days. It's under glass, but the reason it's under glass is because if it wasn't controlled with humidity and if it wasn't controlled with the light that reached it, that paper, that those words that have changed the way that governments are done around the world, not just here, but all around the world, that paper would crumble and fall away. But the words, the words are where the power is. The paper, the paper is just the medium. It, it, it's weak. It falls apart if it's not cared for. But the words are what's important. Now, here's the thing. You and I are just the medium. We are weak and we crumble and we pass away, but the word is where the power is. The word is where the power is. The word is eternal, it's powerful, and so is the Savior, King Jesus, who the word reveals. It says in verse 7, look at verse 7. It says about him, it says, He has the keys of David and what he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. What it's saying about Jesus is that he is God. Jesus is God. He is all-powerful. It's saying about him that he is the Messiah. He is the one that the Father sent to save his people. And Jesus is going to say to the Father in the garden, He's going to say, of all those that you've given to me, I've not lost one. I've not lost one. He'll not fail to save those that are his. He has the key of David. This is his resume. What we're reading in verse 7 is his resume. And if you're not impressed, then you're blind. If you're not impressed, then you're not paying attention. And if you're not confident when you go out and speak his name, then you've closed your eyes to the truth that's right in front of you. Maybe you think this morning that the opportunity to make a difference has passed you by for some reason. The opportunity to make a difference in your son's life or your daughter's life or your friend's life. It's passed you by for some reason because you have the wrong words, because you're in the wrong place, the wrong time, and you're the wrong person. But Jesus says, look at verse 8. Jesus says, Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I've set before you an open door that no one is able to shut. I want you to see this first. I want you to see the door, okay? Because I want you to understand what he means when he's talking about this door. This is a door of opportunity. And not just any opportunity. This is a door of opportunity for the gospel. I have set before you an open door. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Now, here's the big idea that I want you to get from everything we're talking about this morning, okay? Look at your program, write it in, because I want you to walk away, and I want you to continue to think about this this morning. The door of opportunity 
opens to you and me through faithful endurance. Faithful endurance. This is not one of those doors like at the supermarket. There was once a day, believe it or not, I was a very small child. Not just height-wise, that you can believe, but otherwise. I used to have to walk up to those doors. Remember when they used to have the rubber pads, those of you that are over a certain age, and you would walk up to the door, and I'd have to jump up and down on that thing to get the door to open? It's not that kind of door. It's the kind of door that Jesus opens, but he makes you push against it. He's the one that opens it. Don't, 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 don't get me wrong. But you've got to faithfully endure for the door to open. It's not just something that often will just open in front of you. It's something you've got to faithfully endure for that door of opportunity to open before you. I love where he says in Colossians 4.3, Paul says, he says, pray for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ. Paul says, I, I want you to pray because God's got to open this door even as I work so that the door may open. So what are the few of us to do when it seems that the gospel light is all but extinguished in this region where it once burned brighter maybe than any other place in this country? This is why you should study history so you know these things, right? The gospel once burned in this region brighter than any other place in the country. This was once the Bible Belt. What do we do, though, when it seems that that door is shut? I want to say to you this morning, what you do is you trust in the word. What you do is you speak the word. What you do is pray the word. What you do is proclaim the word. What you do is teach the word and obey the word and memorize the word and read the word because it's the only word of life. Whatever other things you might think are the solution to your lack of opportunity in your life. Those things are dead ends. Jesus alone has the word of life. So, I know it's just us few this morning, but if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ, I want you to know that on these pages you encounter the God of the universe. I want you to know on the pages of that book that I hope that you're holding in your hands right now, you encounter the holy judge of the nations. On the pages of that book, you encounter the lover of your soul who satisfies every longing you have and heals every brokenness that you experience. I want you to know that on the pages of this book, you find the one who is the one who extends grace through His Son, Jesus Christ. And I want you to know that this morning, that door is open to you. I know most of you are people that you're here every week. And I know those of you that aren't here every week, you've walked with the Lord for some years. But if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, the door is open to you this morning. Christian brother and sister, what I would say to you is the Word and the risen Savior testifies that he has not only shaken the grave, but he's shaken the nations, he's shaken history, he's shaken the world. And if you think he's done just because you don't see it, just because you don't feel it, just because you think you're not up to the task, then I want to lovingly say to you again, get over yourself. Open your eyes to who you're serving and stop looking at who you are. I want us this morning to see that Jesus holds the key to open the door of salvation for your loved one, for your community, for your nation. I want you to see that second thing this morning. We talked about the door. I want you to see the key, all right? Because the key that's here is the key of authority. The key of authority. I, re I recently bought a used vehicle from a dealership. And there's that moment after you've signed all the paperwork and you've done all the things where they put the key in your hand and you close your fingers around it and you say, that vehicle is now mine. I own it. I possess it. 
and what I want you to understand when it identifies, when Jesus identifies himself as the one who holds the key of David, what he's saying is, I'm the one that has the authority to save. I'm the one that owns those who I have saved. I want you to know that about him this morning. Acts 4, verse 12, it says, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. No other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And by his authority, by his authority, Many who right now are mockers. Maybe that's your child. Maybe that's your neighbor. Maybe it's someone else. Many who are now mockers will one day be believers. Some of you were mockers once. Some of you grew up around the gospel in a Christian home, but you, you despised it for a time. And God has now changed your heart So do not believe, do not believe that that person in your life is beyond the grace of God. They're not. Look at verse 9. Revelation chapter 3, verse 9. Behold, he says, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan. We've seen these people before. These are the, the Jewish people that are persecuting the early church by distancing themselves, removing them from under the umbrella of coverage from the Romans so that they would be persecuted for not worshiping the Roman gods. I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Philippians chapter 2. It says, Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And what I want to say to you this morning is that Every heart will ultimately be humbled by the gospel. Every knee will ultimately bow before Jesus Christ. It will do it either under grace unto salvation or it will do it under wrath unto judgment. One way or another, God's word will be satisfied for the salvation of sinners like you and me. For those who have already come to saving grace and those who have not yet that Jesus is calling. Maybe you're in this room. Maybe it's someone you know that's outside of this room this morning. Verse 10, chapter 3, verse 10. He says, because you have kept my word, and by that he means the gospel. You have kept my word about patient endurance. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. What he means is that final judgment. And then verse 11, every suffering Christian's favorite four words, I am coming soon. He's going to say it three times in chapter 22. Three times Jesus is going to say, I am coming soon. He says it here the first time in this book. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, New Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. If you're keeping track, that's three names he's going to write on you. What, is, what is in the world does that mean? What, it lets, it's like if you've ever traveled outside of the country, you needed your passport, right? You needed your passport. It needed to tell you who you belonged. It needed to tell them what nation you belong to. It needed to tell them who you were. It needed to tell them where you were going. It needs to tell them all these things. And that's exactly what we have here. Jesus, I don't know if it's going to be a tattoo or a name tag. I don't know exactly how it's going to work. But there is going to be on you three names that are going to be the basis for your entry in. The name of Jesus. The new name that you've been given as a new creation through the gospel. And the name of the Father. They'll all be there. So that you can know that you get in. Verse 13, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. But I want to circle back, and I want to talk about this last thing, and I'm almost done. I want you to see, we've seen a door, we've seen a key, and now we want to see a pillar, okay? This pillar 
is a picture of power, but this pillar is the first thing that doesn't point to Jesus. It points to you and me. It points to these weak Christians that he was talking to, this small, insignificant church that the only defining characteristic he has to say about them is that they have just a little power, just a very little power. He says, I'm going to make you a pillar. Now, I know I've already talked about the National Archive. I don't know why I have D.C. on my mind. But if you've ever traveled to Washington, D.C., you know it is a city that is filled with pillars. When they laid out that city and they built these buildings, they wanted to build them with lots of pillars. Why? Because pillars convey strength. They convey permanence. They convey, they, they convey beauty. And what I want you to see here is that he says, I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God. You're weak, but I'm going to make you strong. I'm going to make you strong for this reason. Because you're going to hold open the way so that some people who don't know me yet can enter in. You're going to hold open the way, you weak Christian. You're going to hold open the way so that other people might believe and enter into the temple of God with you. And they're going to walk past and believe it or not, they're going to look at you and they're going to say, you are beautiful. You're beautiful because of what God did through you in my life. He's going to use you in a powerful way through your faithful endurance. You don't have to be powerful. He'll make you powerful. I am so encouraged by 1 Corinthians 2 where Paul says, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling and my message and my speech were not in plausible words of wisdom. I, I'm thankful for those words because if God can use a man who describes himself that way, then God can use you and me too. But what does he go on to say? But I was there in demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And what I have to say to you this morning is we have set before us by Almighty God an open door for the gospel in the most needful city in our nation. Wrap your mind around that. Wrap your mind around the fact that we live in the most needful city in the nation for a gospel light and God has you here with an open door in front of you. He has you here with an open door in front of you. So this morning, what I want is for us, for you, to set our minds, to set our hearts, that we would together walk through that door, that we would commit ourselves, that we're going to walk through that door together. And I want to ask you as a Christian who God's put in a certain place at a certain time in a certain community or a certain school or a certain job with certain friends. He's put them there in your life to set an open door in front of you there too. So I want you to think this morning with who? who, who who's the open door with? Where is the opportunity? What does God want me to do to walk through that door? How does he intend to use me in that place? that I might walk through what's keeping me from it. I don't know about you. I want to stand before Jesus one day, and I know I'm not going to stand before him in my own righteousness. I don't mean that. But I want to stand before him, and I want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful. Not perfect, just good and faithful. And I want you to be standing there with me. Would you pray with me this morning? <sighs> Heavenly Father, we're coming to a time of communion. We're coming to a time where we identify with Jesus, this one whose name is already over our lives and one day will be written on us so that we can be identified as we enter in. I doubt very seriously that's going to be a, a literal thing, but God, that his name would stand before us so that we might enter in. And Father, even as we prepare our hearts for communion this morning, that we might worship the one who paid the price so that that might be true of us. Father, I know that there are many of us that are here this morning, that you've put an open door in front of us, God. 
And maybe what you're saying to us is just continue to be faithful. Just continue to endure. You've been walking through the door. Just continue. And so, Father, I pray this morning that you would keep the enemy from discouraging that Christian's heart, that they would be encouraged that the one that stands before them is Jesus Christ himself and the word that fills their mouth is his perfect, holy, and true word, a word of power, a word of eternity and life. Encourage that heart this morning, I pray. And for those of us that have been timid, that you've set a door in front of us, Father, open our eyes that we might see. Put a boldness in our hearts that we might speak, that we might be tired of living these small, timid, insignificant lives, trying to find significance in social media and, and paychecks and all of the things that the world tells us. How stupid is that? Father, that you would instead desire, that you plant in us a desire that we might have lives of true, eternal importance and the boldness to step through the door because you're the one that does it. Fill our hearts with courage this morning. And for the one that's here this morning, Lord, that doesn't know you, I pray this morning that this would be the morning that they would see the door is open. The way has been made open by Jesus Christ that they might walk through. That they might give up the other things and they might say, this God of the universe who loved me because of how good he is sent his son to die on the cross for me. And that door is there and it's open despite my sin and despite my shame. And I'm going to walk through it this morning. I pray that you do that. And Father, even as we prepare our hearts for communion, if there's some other sin that's there, some other thing that needs to be confessed, Lord, I pray that you do that. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.